Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to another MyALFTraining.com uh, educational seminar. Uh, my name is Deontay J. Marquis. I'm a registered nurse and family nurse practitioner. And today, the topic of our presentation, as you can see, will be epilepsy and seizure care and considerations. So without much further ado, let's begin. Let's see here, there we go. So we're gonna jump first into our course objectives. And here we are going to go over the specific areas that we're gonna be covering about epilepsy and seizures. So, and these are gonna be the takeaways or specific topics that I want you to understand by the end of this presentation. It's an hour long presentation. So first course objective for today will be to define epilepsy and also define seizure and be able to discuss the physical effects of each of those respectively because they vary, although they may seem similar as you, uh, some of you may have the same idea as I did that an epilepsy and a seizure were two separate things or two very similar things. So we will learn how to specifically distinguish between an epilepsy and a seizure by using a clinical definition as well as the physical effects that each can have. Our second course objective for today will be able to recognize and identify common symptoms associated with seizure onset. So when a uh, individual is about to have a seizure, there aren't always indicators that let us know that something's going on inside that person's brain that manifests physically so that we can see and recognize those uh, symptoms as, uh, as indicating a seizure onset. So by the end of this presentation, you will have an idea of how problems in the brain that cause a seizure present themselves physically in a person and can clue us in on specific individuals who may be about to have a seizure. And it's important to be able to do this because as we'll discuss, sometimes with the seizures, people injure themselves. So of course, being able to recognize uh, physical symptoms that let us know a person, a person may be about to have a seizure is important because we can then keep that person from falling or injuring themselves uh, or what have you. So it's very important. And we will learn that by the end of this presentation, you will understand uh, those physical manifestations. Our third course objective for today, um, you will be able to discuss specific care considerations for those people who have a seizure uh, in comparison to individuals who suffer from epilepsy. So we will go over what the demands of that disability or disease is uh, referring to seizure and epilepsy. And we will better understand what that individual suffering from either of those diseases needs and um, what we should be looking for and things that uh, when we're caring for these individuals specifically. Uh, and last but not least, by the end of this presentation, you will be able to recognize and also discuss with other members of your healthcare team, emergency safety concerns for residents who we notice are suffering from an active seizure or epilepsy, who just generally suffer from epilepsy. So of course, when we're caring for patients and we're in the professional uh, setting of healthcare, we have to always be prepared for emergencies. And we know emergencies don't always happen, but when they happen, we have to be ready. So in this last objective, we'll talk about uh, emergency safety concerns when we've identified those physical symptoms uh, to let us know that an individual is about to have a seizure. We know the care considerations that we practice every day to keep that person safe, but uh, this person is in an emergency safety concern. They're actively having a seizure. We're gonna learn what to do in that situation, okay? 
So let's begin. So first, we're gonna talk about what is epilepsy. And you see, I put this uh, picture of the different uh, signals going off in the brain all at once, because that kind of gives you an idea of what is going on inside the brain that leads to a seizure. But first, let's talk a bit about the definition. So what is epilepsy? Epilepsy is a chronic disorder. So that means it continues to occur unless it's uh, treated, of course. Uh, it's a chronic condition in which an individual has seizures that are unprovoked. So unprovoked meaning that sometimes um, individuals who don't have epilepsy or who do, who do or don't have this chronic condition, they will still suffer from seizures when they have a low blood sugar or they're going through alcohol withdrawals or they've suffered from some type of severe trauma to the head and it's caused damage to the nerves or to the brain, what have you. And uh, this person has seizures occasionally, chronically, okay? So an ep epilepsy is simply a chronic condition in which an individual continues to have seizures with no particular rhyme or reason um, that provokes, uh, that causes an onset of these seizures. Now, they we know that epilepsy is caused by brain injury. There's a specific link to individuals who, suff who have suffered some type of brain injury that uh, develop epilepsy. So they don't just have one seizure at the time of the injury and maybe another one uh, a few days or weeks later. No, they develop a chronic condition where they continuously have seizures. And also family history. Family history is another link to epilepsy. Um, of course, we get a lot of our health, uh, our health con uh, issues and benefits from our family. So uh, epilepsy has also been linked to that familial pass down trait. And last, uh, a lot of the reasons behind why some individuals suffer from epilepsy are unknown, right? We, they have, we have no idea why these people continuously have um, seizures. And the reoccurrence, how often do they come? It's very spontaneous. There is no way to predict them other than an individual giving you, uh, the actual individual who has the seizures or the caregiver, someone who lives with them all the time, letting you know how often they seem to have a seizure. But remember, we still can't predict when someone will have a seizure. And uh, for most of the cases, neither can the patient. Now, compare uh, epilepsy definition to our definition of a seizure. What is a seizure? A seizure, remember an epilepsy is a person who chronically has seizures. So what is a seizure? Um, a seizure is an isolated event and it's a sudden surge of electrical activity in the brain. So remember I showed you this picture here of all the electrical activity, this is no different. Um, except it's a single event. And it's a surge of this electrical activity inside the brain that affects the person for a short amount of time and everything just kind of goes haywire. That's the best way to explain it. Um, what causes the, just a single um, event of a seizure? And that is actually a stroke. Because remember, uh, in a stroke, when a person has an ischemic stroke, which is the most common type of stroke, there is, that is caused by a sudden interruption in blood flow to the brain, right? So parts of the brain are then traumatized because they didn't get enough oxygen. Now that trauma caused by a stroke can lead to a seizure. It can lead to many other things as well, but there is a link found between stroke and seizures. Um, and how often is the recurrence? Well, just like epilepsy, for the most part, uh, it's unpredictable, it's a spontaneous event. But uh, we do know that half of the people who have a seizure will indeed have another. And after one person has two seizures, there's an 80% chance for them to have another. So the chances are that if an individual has a seizure, that they will likely have another. And if they have that one, then they'll have another. 
So we, it's safe to say that most individuals who unfortunately have a seizure may also have developed epilepsy, which is a chronic unprovoked uh, seizure disorder. And if you look to your right here, this graph for what looks like just a bunch of squiggly lines, um, this is from a device that doctors can use to gauge the brain activity or the electrical activity inside of a person's brain and just measure specific parts of the brain where that increased activity is. And maybe they'll even watch the patient while they're hooked up to this machine to see if they can identify any triggers that cause the seizure. So uh, as we can see here, I kind of circled the area so you can see how much more chaotic the right side of this graph is in comparison to the left, okay? So that is a seizure and that is epilepsy. So now I want to show you guys and gals a video to better illustrate um, epilepsy and seizure. Uh, forgive me if we have a commercial here, slight delay. There we go. A seizure is a brief episode of abnormal electrical activity in a person's brain. It's like when your radio goes fuzzy when you go through a tunnel, or when your television gets funny picture for a couple of seconds and returns back to normal. There are many types of seizures. With some seizures, a person may become very stiff. They pass out and their whole body shakes. Some people have seizures where they become confused and may have movements that seem silly or don't make sense. They might not respond for a couple of minutes. Some people have seizures that are so short that all they do is stare for about 10 seconds and may just flutter their eyes. Some people have seizures where very suddenly they become weak and fall to the ground. Some people have seizures daily Others have them every couple of months, and many kids have them every now and then, or never because they're on medications to control them. Epilepsy is when a person has two or more seizures from something other than a head injury or from being very sick. Having epilepsy or seizures is nobody's fault. Sometimes people may have different types of seizures with their epilepsy. Some people with epilepsy may have a reason for their seizures, such as a brain injury when they were born or a trauma that may have occurred. All right, so we're gonna stop that video there and go back to our presentation. So I think that the way kids explain things is always the easiest un to understand. And with epilepsy and seizure, I recognize that it's one, they're very similar, it's easy to confuse them, and it's not something that's very easily understood, especially because there are several different types of seizures. There's not just one in particular seizure as the kids there demonstrated. So I wanted to choose a video in which kids gave their explanation of what they believe epilepsy to be. So let's talk a bit more about epilepsy. Let's specifically get into the facts. So this is for you to gauge the prevalence or how many uh, residents living in your facility or patients that live in your facility or that you attend to throughout the day that may have epilepsy. So one in 26 people living in the United States will develop epilepsy. 65 million people in the world are actually living with epilepsy today already. And what is epilepsy again? We know that epilepsy is when an individual has two or more seizures that are unprovoked. And this becomes a chronic condition. And yes, it is a chronic condition, but as our kids told us in the video, it can be treated with medication and is very often treated with medication, of course, because we don't want individuals to uh, have unexpected seizures because that's a major 
health and safety concern. 150,000 more people are diagnosed with epilepsy every single year. So it's not something that's slowing down. It's something that's still very prevalent in today's society. Um, and for every six out of 10 people, the cause of epilepsy remains unknown. So if you recall, remember when I first introduced our definition of epilepsy, I'll let you know that brain trauma was one of the main causes. Um, low blood sugar was another common cause, but still unknown was also listed as a common cause because for many instances, we don't know what is causing an individual's epilepsy or continuous uh, unprovoked seizures, right? So for every six out of 10 people who have epilepsy, the cause is unknown. So that's a huge issue, right? Very, very prevalent. That's one in every six people. What to look for? So we know now how common epilepsy is in society and we know the causes of it and what separates epilepsy from seizures, right? and some of the causes. So we even have a bit of an idea about that individual's medical history now, because we know what some of the different causes are um, between epilepsy and seizure. So what to look for? Well, the general symptoms and warning signs that we're gonna be looking for uh, would include, as you can see, lightheadedness, deja vu. And we know deja vu is the feeling that uh, you're doing something twice, or um, I feel like I already ate breakfast, but you actually haven't eaten breakfast. For some reason, you just have this overwhelming feeling that you've already done it, or you've been here before. Uh, numbness and tingling. Numbness and tingling. It doesn't matter where. It could be in the hands, the eyes, the feet. They just report some numbness and tingling staring off into space. So if you see an individual staring off into, uh, into space, it's looking like they're just uh, gazing out of the window or reflecting on their life, we still wanna go up to that patient, tap them on the shoulder. Are you doing okay? Just checking on you, just that simple. Um, because we wanna you know, see if they jolt back to reality or if that staring continues and we can tell that they're not just ignoring us, then we know that, hey, this might be a warning sign. I think this uh, patient is, is about to have a seizure. And I'll get, uh, we'll, we'll develop, we'll delve a little bit deeper into what to do if that specific scenario happens. Um, but although seizure onset is spontaneous and quick, it happens very quick. I'll tell you a personal story from my experience. Um, some patients exhibit and report brief symptoms before an episode. So that's important to note the end of that sentence where some patients exhibit and even report brief symptoms before an episode. So that, they, so that means that after their brain has gone haywire during this seizure, they come back to themselves and they still have a bit of consciousness or a recollection of what they were thinking and feeling before they had the seizure. But uh, many times during the seizure, the patient uh, can't recall, or the individual who's had the seizure can't recall what they were doing before or at all, uh, in fact, what happened during the seizure. Some people are aware of the beginning of a seizure, possibly as much as hours or days before it happens. So that means they recognize that something isn't right something strange is going on, but they may not be, be able to identify that specific feeling as a precursor to having a stroke. So they may not put two and two together. And that's why we are there and we're having this conversation today about epilepsy and seizure. So you can help them identify that feeling and relate it to the last time they had a seizure. And therefore we can have a, a, a prevention instead of an intervention for a situation that happened, we can prevent a situation from happening where they fall over in the chair and hurt their head or their back or their arm. Now, that's some patients who can report this information to you. While there are still many patients who aren't aware at the beginning and have no physical warning signs, okay? 
So not everybody is going to remember have or even have symptoms to remember. Some of them, just as I said, is gonna be very spontaneous and very quick. Now, before I get into the different types of seizures here, um, I wanna discuss with you guys uh, the just a quick um, excerpt from my own personal experience. Um, I was caring for a patient. I uh, went to the patient, the shift had just started. I remember this like it was yesterday. The shift had just started. Um, the patient wanted to get out of bed to the chair. Um, I was unable to uh, visit the patient or help. So someone else went to help the patient get into the chair with no problem. The patient uh, didn't have any problems with walking as I got from the nurse and report and saw in the chart that was correct. The patient had no trouble with walking or falling. It was there for some type of infection, right? Um, no history of seizures either. Um, this patient actually had uh, a drop attack. Um, as you can see here, is a sudden loss of muscle strength or tone. So just suddenly, just losing the ability to stand up. And the patient had this particular type of seizure while I had returned to help get the patient back to bed. The patient just needed some help standing up. I believe there was an infection and there was a knee surgery, something along those lines. But anyway, I helped the patient stand up, turn, pivoted to help uh, get the patient back in the bed. And uh, I don't remember what he said to me before, but he just collapsed right in my arm. And I'm holding him and he was a tall guy. He wasn't uh, very heavy. Uh, well, he wasn't a very like very heavy guy, but when someone falls into your arms, of course, and they lose all their muscle strength, they become very heavy. Um, and I just had to use my last bit of energy to help uh, help hip toss him into the bed. And that was a big learning experience for me. The patient said that had happened to him once before. It was an undiagnosed type of seizure. Um, and he was found to indeed have uh, epilepsy and uh, drop attack was his specific type of seizures that he had. So just that quick guys, unexpectedly spontaneous, the patient can fall. And if I wasn't there, if the patient was a healthy guy and he wasn't there for his knee surgery or his infection, he would have tried to get up by himself, maybe had gotten, maybe have gotten a little further and then collapsed and fallen and he could have seriously hurt himself. So that is important to keep in mind and consider, especially when we're caring for patients who have a history of seizure. Um, we want to make sure we understand what type of seizure they have, what to expect if they go into an active seizure. And of course, we want to try and identify any signs or symptoms that that individual may be about to have a seizure, right? So the first type of seizure that we're going to talk about is a grand mal seizure. Now, a grand mal seizure is uh, when an individual has a loss of consciousness, um, they can fall, they convulse. So this is that very stereotypical type of seizure that you may have heard about or seen or read about, um, where an individual loses consciousness, they fall, they start to violently convulse on the floor. Sometimes they may lose their uh, bladder, their ability to hold their bladder. Sometimes they may vomit or start jerking from side to side, that is a grand mal seizure. That's the big, the big guy, right? The duration is usually one to five minutes, very short. Um, the, in my case, the individual, uh, his seizure was about 10 seconds, which if you go to drop attack on our right here, the duration is usually about 15 seconds. Um, so grand mal seizures last about one to five minutes, follows by uh, long periods of confusion, headaches, and sleep. Um, I've taken care of a patient who had a grand mal seizure as well. It was very characteristic of what uh, the stereotypical type of seizure, exactly what uh, I read here. And it was followed by um, the individual was just very sleepy for the rest of that day and into the morning of the following day. Um, didn't want to eat or anything. So 
That is grand mal. That's the big type of seizure. That's the big guy, right? Next is a petite mal seizure. A uh, petite mal seizure is characterized by uh, blank staring, rapid blinking. Um, the individual will also make kind of like a, a chewing motion, like they're chewing on something, but they're actually not. And this individual is having a petite mal. And these are exceptionally short. They're the shortest of all the seizures lasting only about five to 10 seconds. But because they're so short, they can happen several times throughout the day, right? And it's a blank staring, rapid blinking, uh, chewing motion type of seizure. Um, third is a complex partial. Now this complex partial is similar to a petite mal seizure uh, in that both are characteristic, uh, characterized by staring and chewing motions, except a complex partial, complex partial seizure is a little bit more involved with the body and that the person uh, kind of picks at their clothes randomly and just kind of starts moving very robotically, acting very strange, okay? Um, and maybe sometimes this individual wanders around and just can't respond to you for some reason. Um, this is very strange behavior, strange movements. And this seizure can last about one to three minutes, okay? So we have our grandma, which is very characteristic, falls to the floor, loses consciousness, starts convulsing. That's our big guy. We have a petite mall blank staring, chewing motion, about five to 10 seconds, very short, it's the little guy, but can happen many times during the day. Now we also have our complex partial, which also the individual may have some staring and chewing movements, but more specifically, this individual is also gonna have rapid random body movements. I'm sorry, robotic random body movements. And also, we may see some wandering or inability of this person to respond to us. This type of seizure lasts about one to three minutes. So a moderate amount of time, about, about right in the middle with relativity to how short the petite mal seizure is and how long a grand mal seizure is. Complex partial is in the middle. It lasts about one to three minutes. There is also a simple partial so a simple partial, it's funny because it's, I guess you can say it's a little bit more simpler in terms of how it presents in comparison to complex, but just as many parts of the body are still involved in a simple partial. Uh, but it's given the simple partial, I guess, because the person at the end is still very aware and knows what it is and what's going on. So they can let you know and they can talk to you um, about what's going on with them. So a simple partial, the individual is going to exhibit uh, symptoms of jerking. So just their body's jerking. It's like uncontrollable for them. And you can see these movements in their arms, in their legs, in their face. Um, and again, the person knows what's going on in a simple partial, okay? And this uh, type of seizure lasts about a few seconds to a few minutes. Now our last type of seizure, and this is the example I gave you from my own personal experience, this individual had a drop attack. And we talked about how this is a sudden loss of muscle strength and tone. This person can just collapse to the floor just suddenly. And that's exactly what happened in the instance with my guy. Uh, and it, it, he was providing no, uh, no strength from his legs. They were folding under him, um, his arms. He was just sliding out of my arms. Absolutely no muscle tone. Um, and all he said was um, he remembered the look on my face when he was uh, when right before he blacked out. And he was he he he, re he remembers thinking to himself, "I hope he can hold me." That's what he told me he remembers thinking to himself. And he was pleasantly surprised to find himself laying in the bed without any injuries, 
about 30 seconds later and I told him what happened and he uh, was relieved and apologized. And, um, and that's when I asked him, had this happened to you before? What happened? Are you okay? I'm, I'm checking his vital signs. I'm, I'm, I'm a little freaked out because uh, I know how close I was to uh, dropping him um, and about what happened. So um, drop attack, it explains itself. Um, and but very short duration, okay? So these are the different types of seizures. Now, if you look these up on your own, they may have different names, um, different nicknames, but the, the physical signs and the duration will not change. Um, and you'll be able to easily identify which one was which as we talked about them here today. So these are our uh, five types of main types of seizures. Now, you're probably wondering, uh, are they all emergencies? We've talked, I've given you five different types of seizures. Each one sounds scary in its own right. Some sound scarier than the next, right? Some compared to the other ones don't sound as bad. And you're probably asking yourself, are they all emergencies? Are they all, of course, they're all very situ serious situations, but seizures, do not usually require emergency medical attention, right? Even though you may think they are, I thought they all were at one point. If an individual has epilepsy, they're used to this. They have hopefully some type of a caregiver or plan in place, or they know how to care for themselves in these situations. They've done something, right? To prepare for this unexpected occurrence. It's only considered an emergency if one of the following is true for the patient, however. So seizures are emergencies only if one of these are true. So ask yourself, has the patient ever, the patient has never had a seizure before? If the patient has never had a seizure before, then it's considered an emergency because uh, this is a new onset. We need to figure out what is, we need to try and figure out what is causing this. Because if, if it's a head trauma, then we need to treat that before it becomes worse. Or perhaps the patient um, had a stroke and is now having a seizure, an undetectable stroke, right? Remember we talked about how a stroke can also is linked to uh, seizures. So we wanna try and figure, figure it out. So if the patient has never had a seizure before, then, and they suddenly you see them having a seizure, then we wanna act as if this is a serious medical emergency. If the patient has difficulty breathing or waking up after the seizure. Now the patient may not be able to respond full as normally as they would or engage in um, conversation back and forth. They should still be able to respond to you after their seizure. Now remember seizures, uh, we talked about the grand mal lasting as long as five minutes. And we talked about the uh, complex partial lasting as long as three minutes. So that's the amount of time, and it's not longer than that, although it feels like it's been a lot longer. So make sure, uh, here's a pro tip. If your individual has a seizure, before you respond, just glance at your watch, kind of note what time it is, so that after they, if they're, uh, so that you know when they wake up about what time they should, they should have woken up by, and you know whether or not, uh, they've went past that normal time. And it's, you can consider this uh, type of, this seizure an emergency. So the person has difficulty breathing or waking up after the seizure. So of course, if someone's having trouble breathing, that's a medical emergency. Why would someone who just had a seizure um, stop breathing? Well, uh, the brain controls the respiratory center maybe something happened with electrical impulses that shut off, slowed down the breathing mechanism in the brain, or perhaps the individual aspirated. What does aspirated mean? Well, we talked about uh, in our seizures here, uh, the grand mal, sometimes a uh, symptom is the individual will start vomiting. Well, if no one was around to respond and properly implement care considerations for that patient, they may have aspirated or swallow their, their vomit and now they can't breathe, okay? That's a medical emergency, of course. 
Uh, if the seizure lasts longer than five minutes, I talked to you just last, just a second ago about checking your watch, checking the time before an individual has a seizure. So you know um, if, you, if you can identify based on their symptoms, what type of seizure, seizure they're having, and then you can identify uh, the length of time that that individual should be actively having a seizing a seizure before you can expect them to wake up and respond to you. The longest seizure is a grand mal, which lasts no longer, shouldn't last longer than five minutes. So if this person has a seizure that lasts longer than five minutes, then that's a medical emergency, okay? Next, the person has another seizure as soon as the first one. So if they have one seizure, everything stops, seems normal, they stop seizing, they're opening their eyes. You say, are you okay? They say yes, and then they have another one as soon as they respond to you. That is a medical emergency, okay? This person um, need to figure out what's going on because they shouldn't be having seizures back to back like this. That means something more is going on. This person needs more medical attention. Uh, so that's considered an emergency. Another emergency, if the person is hurt, during the seizure. So if the person falls during the seizure or if they fall um, next, if they fall in the middle of the day room and they have a seizure and they turn and they hit their head on a pole that is on the table, they're not going to stop because they hit their head on the pole. It's their brain that's malfunctioning. So that, so one, they're unable to stop. These are involuntary movements. And two, um, they, they have no recollection of what happened. So they're not aware of what's going on. So their body can't properly, like if you put a hot plate to someone, they'll pull away. Their body uh, can't do those things. That part of the brain isn't working correctly. So if, the per if we notice that the person is hurt um, during the seizure, then that is considered an emergency because we, of course, want to make sure that we identify the severity of the injury and we treat the injury as soon as possible. And last but not least, and this one's the most scariest, um, if the seizure happens in water, it's a serious emergency, right? And we can understand why, because we just talked about the patient is unable to control their body if they're having a seizure. Also there are seizures such as drop seizure, the patient's not gonna be breathing right, they're more than likely not going to be floating. Um, if they're taking a bath, uh, we want to make sure because sometimes the, uh, a lot of the symptoms is the patient falls asleep afterwards. They may fall asleep and slump down into the tub and drown in the bathtub. Very terrible things can happen. Um, so if the individual has a seizure in water, that is a serious emergency and we need to be ready for it. So these are the six criteria that will classify a seizure as an emergency. Not all seizures are medical emergencies, right? But all seizures do warrant a level of safety concern. So what do you do first to uh, make sure that we keep our patients safe? if we notice that they're having a seizure. So we talked about the five different types of seizure and we've talked about what, make them, what makes them an emergency, but we're not here just to learn about what these things are. We're here to learn about what to do in these situations, right? So the first step is to recognize the symptoms of a seizure and you need to be confident in your judgment and respond. So in order for you to be confident in your judgment, you need to understand these terms, these concepts, and these symptoms so that if you, when you see them, you know them, you recognize them, and you leap into action. Second step, you want to ease the person to the floor into, an, into a lying position. A lying position is preferred, especially over a sitting position. I'm going to ask you guys why. That is correct. It is preferred over a sitting position because in a lying position, the person, they're not going anywhere. If they, lose, if they have a drop attack while they're lying down, they're already lying down. But if, they, if we help them from a standing to a sitting position, 
when they have a drop attack, they may slide out of the chair, they may slump over, flip over the side of the chair, they may convulse, hit their head on the wall. We don't know, right? So we wanna make sure if we recognize the symptoms, confident in our judgment, and we make our first response, which is to ease the person to the floor. Now, if, we, if they're near their bed, of course, please, let's get them in their bed. But life isn't always so easy for us to make uh, those type of movements. The patient has a seizure right next to the bed. Oh, perfect, let's just lay them in the bed. It's not always that easy. So we wanna lie, get them into a lying position, okay? Our next step, we've got the patient in a lying position. They're having their seizure or they're about to have their seizure. We want to turn the patient gently onto their side. Now, if the patient's violently having uh, spasms and jerking movements, we don't want to try to uh, restrict their body from moving. We don't want to uh, block them from moving a certain way unless they're gonna roll out of the bed. But we just want to gently try and put them on their side or make sure maybe we prop pillows on one side of their head to make sure that if they do vomit, it prevents aspiration and promotes breathing by keeping that airway clear and protected. Now, our next step would be to clear the area around them so they don't hurt themselves. Remember, we talked about this. We talked about an individual being on the floor, hurting themselves, and we want to make sure that if the individual is on the floor having a seizure or anywhere else, that we move, we move things that are around them away so that they don't hurt themselves or break anything that's around them or hurt someone else by mistake. They might be kicking, other people are walking around them and they may trip one of those people or they may be kicking or jerking their arms and then they kick a wall and hurt themselves. So we just wanna prevent that. We wanna make sure that if they're on the floor, there's nothing else around them. And our last step, our last step is going to be time the seizure. I talked about uh, checking your watch when we first noticed those symptoms. And that's still one of the best things you can do if an individual is having a seizure. Because the first thing the doctor is gonna do when you speak to him or the nurse, when you speak to him or her, is how long did the seizure last? And we wanna give them an exact answer because we're literally talking minutes and seconds. We don't wanna guesstimate because that's key information that's gonna help the doctor identify the type of seizure and also treat this patient that had that specific type of seizure. So it's very important to keep a detailed mental inventory of what you saw and how long it lasted. And also I put here uh, some specific documentation uh, things that either you wanna put in your chart when you make a note about the seizure or uh, for you to write down on a piece of paper to make sure you don't forget or scramble this information and you have it for the nurse or the doctor or whoever is asking for this information about the seizure. So of course, when did the symptoms start? This is very important. We wanna know when the symptoms started. We checked our watch when the seizure started, when the, when the patient was staring off into space. So we have that time. What were the symptoms? Well, we were watching the patient the entire time. So this should be easy. Make sure you tell them about all the symptoms, the strange movements, the sounds, everything, right? Did the patient lose consciousness? We want to ask this. Um, we're continuously asking the patient, are you okay? Um, and we'll usually know definitively about the a loss of consciousness after the stroke, especially if they're having a grand mal, after they've stopped all the violent movement, are you okay? Or did they close their eyes and just go to sleep? Which is usually a very common side effect. Uh, side effect. And we also want to know, was one extremity more active or restless than the other? Um, just another way and things, these are some things you should look for when the patient is having a seizure. Things you should try and keep an account of to make sure that you share the important information with the rest of your healthcare team. And we're going to go into another quick video here.
All right. There's a certain section I want to show you guys. Letting it load up here. Here we go. If you suspect someone is having a seizure, it's important to protect them from harming themselves during the fit. Clear away any potential dangerous objects like hot drinks or sharp objects. Don't restrain or move them. Make a note of the time when the seizure started and how long it lasts. Protect their head by placing something soft underneath or around it, like a towel, and loosen any clothing around their neck. Once the seizure has stopped, open their airway and check their breathing. If they're breathing, put them into the recovery position. If they stop breathing at any point, prepare to treat someone who is unresponsive. All right. So just so you guys can get a visual of what someone looks like, we saw he was experiencing, uh, their guy was suffering from a grand mal seizure, right? Um, and we saw she put pillows beside them. She uh, turned him to what she said was the recovery position. Um, everything we've been talking about, right? Checking the time, everything. So what not to do? Do not try to give the patient mouth to mouth threats like CPR. People usually start breathing again on their own after a seizure. So do not try to give them mouth to mouth breath. Give them a second to breathe on their own, assess their respiratory situation, um, check for breath sounds, listen for breath, um, and then if they haven't, after you give them uh, uh, an opportunity to resume breathing after a seizure, then we call it, we start CPR. Um, do not hold the person down or try to stop his or her movements. We talked about that before. I'm reiterating that here. Um, do not offer the person water or food until he or she is fully alert. That's very important because sometimes the patient may ask for some directly after um, they have their seizure. That's a way we show care and concern is for someone who's just been through something, we offer them some water. The patient may look hot. They may look like they're thirsty. They may say they're thirsty or hungry. We don't wanna give them food or water and risk aspiration until they're fully alert again, until they're able to tell us who they are, where they are, what time it is. And we talk to them a bit about what just happened and we feel like they're back to their normal self. Um, the stroke, the seizure has, the effects of the seizure has subsided and we can safely give them uh, food or water. And last but not least, do not put anything in the person's mouth. This can injure their teeth or jaw. A person having a seizure cannot swallow his or her tongue. And you heard that here. You may hear differently from other people. As far as I'm concerned, a person having a seizure cannot swallow his or her tongue. If for some reason you are you are very worried about this person swallowing their own tongue and choking on their tongue, turn them into the recovery position. But please do not put anything in the person's mouth, especially something that can uh, fall into their mouth and, eventually, and uh, block their airway or that they would hurt their teeth on if they bit down on it. Because remember their body is jerking, moving as it wants and they can't control it. So if they chomp down on that metal pin that you put in their mouth to make sure that they don't swallow their tongue and they break their teeth or their dentures, you're going to be in a lot of trouble and they're going to be very upset about that. So please don't put anything in the patient's mouth, especially not your finger. Um, so more safety tips and precautions for individuals living with epilepsy or seizure. Um, showers instead of baths. Remember, uh, I would much more prefer my patient to have a drop attack while they're having a shower as opposed to having a bath and drowning in the bathtub, right? Hope you agree. 
Uh, give hot food or drink items with caution. We don't want them to have a seizure while they're holding a very hot bowl of soup. So make sure they're sitting down when we give them hot things. They have somewhere clear to put it down and that the temperature just overall isn't, isn't so hot that if it falls, it will burn them immediately. Uh, we want to issue medical alert bracelets. So while this patient is, wants to go for a walk or they're not under our direct care or they're under the care of someone new who's not familiar with their seizures or their seizure uh, epilepsy disorder that they can identify that this person has seizures um, by their medical alert bracelet. Um, so this person doesn't go outside alone or do certain activities alone. We wanna make sure we encourage and promote a healthy sleep pattern. That's important for everyone. Um, especially the elderly, especially, especially the elderly who are suffering from uh, seizure or epilepsy, because what that's going to do is just help give the brain some time to relax and recharge. Um, and it's very important. We want to make sure we encourage and promote a healthy sleep pattern. And most importantly to me is we want to note new medications because they can possibly have interactions with the patients, uh, not only the medication that the patient is taking, but they can have interactions with the brain activity causing the brain, the patient's mood, the patient's ability to sleep, sleep too much. We wanna make sure we're monitoring those little things because remember, it's not exactly known what causes a seizure, especially in patients who have epilepsy. So we wanna try and narrow down on the things that could be causing those events because we wanna keep our patients safe, we wanna keep them happy, and we wanna keep them healthy. Medication management. So anti-seizure medications may have some side effects which are mild and others that are more serious. So it's important to make sure we manage our patient's symptoms that are caused by seizure because we want them to keep taking this medication every single day, right? We don't want them to want to skip this medication or to start hiding hiding it from us that they didn't take it because it's a very important medication. So some of the symptoms that you should look for that you may want to talk to the patient about, you may want to help manage, uh, severe would be a body rash uh, and more mental issues, depression and suicidal ideation. So we want to make sure that we're trying to cheer the patient up, encouraging them to participate with others and do uh, activities and whatnot, and also uh, asking them when you ask them, when you're worried someone may be having suicidal ideation, you don't beat around the bush. You ask them straight, are you, are you uh, having thoughts of committing suicide? And if they are, they will tell you. Um, mild symptoms that we want to look out for, uh, skin rashes, memory problems, dizziness, weight gain, loss of coordination, speech problems. These are mild symptoms, but we want to make sure we talk to the patient about those symptoms so they don't think that it's just themselves, but we let them know that, hey, you have a disorder. These are the medications we need to take. And unfortunately, you're suffering from one of the mild symptoms uh, that go along with this medication. We can talk to the doctor if it's uh, too uncomfortable for you uh, and see if there's a different medication, which what doesn't cause this side effect. But for now, we, we understand how important it is for you to take your seizure medication and we're gonna to continue to do so until we can find some alternative. But in the meantime, I'm gonna start applying some more skin cream to help reduce the redness of those skin rashes, just to help the individual cope with these side effects and symptoms. All right, we have reached the end of the presentation, guys. We've made it almost a full hour. Um, and I'm just gonna, I have two multiple choice questions here that I'm gonna ask you to test your knowledge and then we're going to conclude for the day. So review question number one, you are conversing with a patient who suddenly stops speaking mid sentence and begins staring at the wall and blinking repeatedly. This patient is likely having what type of seizure? So we talked about this, an individual who stops mid sentence, stares at the wall, blinks, these are key characteristics of what type of seizure. I'll give you all a minute to reply. 
Let's see. Petite Mall, if you answered B, then you answer correctly because yes, the correct answer is Petite Mall. That is the type of seizure that we talked about. And let's just hurry back so we can revisit that slide. You see Petite Mall, blank staring, rapid blinking. That's the only type of seizure where a person uh, has the rapid blinking. Complex partial, the patient is also staring. But I specifically said blank staring and rapid blinking. Okay. And question two, while helping a patient complete their ADLs in the morning, they begin jerking different parts of their body uncontrollably. When you ask them what's going on, they reply, I don't know. What type of seizure is this patient likely having? So body jerks and the patient is unaware of what's going on because we asked them what's going on and they replied, I don't know. So what type of seizure is this patient likely having? Is it A, grand mal, B, petite mal, C, complex partial, or D, simple partial? And I'll give you guys a minute to respond. Okay, so let's see what your answer was. And if you chose D, simple partial, then you chose correct because that is the type of seizure this individual was suffering from. Simple partial, jerking from the body. And uh, that is the main symptom here, okay? So course review, as you see, we checked off all of our course objectives. We defined what an epilepsy was. The kids helped us to understand it better. Um, we also, that says stroke, it's supposed to say seizure. See how easy, uh, even I sometimes get all three of these things mixed together. So define epilepsy and seizure and be able to discuss the physical effects of each. We did that. Recognize and identify common symptoms associated with stroke onset. We talked about those. Be able to discuss care considerations for individuals who suffer from a stroke versus those who suffer from epilepsy. We talked about that, as well as emergency safety concern and what to do and what not to do for seizure and epilepsy. We're, we're done, guys. We've finished our hour here. I want to thank you on behalf of myalftraining.com. Thank you for using us today. Thank you for spending this hour with me. My name is Deontay. I'm a family nurse practitioner, registered nurse in Southern California. And it was my pleasure spending the last hour with you guys. And I hope to see you again soon.